Hannes National Park. This state is also where the majority of the world's black tea is grown, which is extremely important for elephant conservation, which again, I'll talk about as the presentation goes on. So Asian elephant distribution, Asian elephants once occurred from the Tigris Euphrates in Western Asia, east through Iran, south of the Himalayas, throughout South and Southeast Asia, including Sri Lanka, Sumatra, and Borneo, and into mainland China. They've disappeared from many of this historic range, including from Western Asia, Iran, and China. It is estimated that at the end of the century, there were more than 100,000 elephants in Asia. And today, the number of Asian elephants is about 48,000. And I'll, I'll talk, I'm going to um, show you some maps. Well, here's another map of their distribution, but I think this one's a little bit better to give you some numbers. Um, so if you look at this, you can see, you know, anywhere from like in Nepal, 100 to 170 elephants. But if you look at India, and I'm gonna give you another visual of this because this is a little clustered and hard to see, but I, I like this map because of the geography. But on this map, we can see, you know, it's, it's graphed a little bit easier to see proportionally where the elephants are. So this really clearly shows us that the majority of the world's remaining Asian elephants are found in India. And it's important to say that while most of the, um, let's see, let me give you some numbers actually. So approximately about 48,000 Asian elephants, about 25,000 Asian elephants in India. In the Northeast of India, there's eight to 10, this is approximate of course, um, elephants with the Assam where I was, five to 8,000 remaining Asian elephants. So. It's largely said that Assam has the last viable population in the world of Asian elephants. It's a very, very important um, part of the world for conservation of these animals. Um, some of these animals are, are I'm talking about are wild, and we're going to talk also about captive elephants, um, because in Assam in particular, there is a large relatively large number of captive elephants, which are actually really important for many, many reasons. So when you're an endangered, you know, endangered animals or other um, non-animal species can be listed under these different um, organizations. So they are listed in, as the I, IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, in 1986, they were listed. They're listed as endangered by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, CITES classified one, the Convention for International Trade on Endangered Species. So clearly, you know, there, there's world work being done to help prevent the further decline of this incredible animal. So um, this next picture is showing uh, my friend, Lisa Mills, and she, I had worked for her um, as a naturalist when I was in graduate school in Montana at the Montana Natural History Center. And she and her husband, Scott Mills, um, he's a well-known conservation biologist, were living in Bhutan and she was working on um, some conservation in Assam. And she reached out to me and asked if I wanted to write about elephant conservation in Assam. And of course it took me um, a split second to say, when can I start? And there was so much to learn. There was so much. So I, I first started doing a lot of research just over the internet as one will do. You know, I'm in Santa Fe, Assam is halfway across the world. Um, and I just quickly got steeped in this and, and so much to learn cultures and conservation and biology and, all of these things. And I, I wanted to find, you know, what is my hook in this story? Who's my audience? What's my voice? And she told me about Dr. Sarma. And I realized um, his story was so phenomenal. He could be really the sort of central character of my narrative. The problem, of course, was he lived in a, uh, India and I, again, lived in Santa Fe. Um, I was very lucky because first he came to visit Lisa and Scott when they were actually living in North Carolina. So I went and I visited him. And we had such a wonderful time. I spent two days asking him questions. I, I invited myself to India and I got to go the next year. 
So as I said, I spent three years, uh, three years, I wish, three, three weeks with Dr. Sarma traveling around, um, meeting elephants, talking to people um, and learning just as much as I could. And as I said before, I realized that he really was the central narrative. Um, around him, I could develop all the other pieces of the story, the conservation, um, the natural history and all the other pieces I wanted to bring in. So I think what I'll do is I'll start with about a, like a very short one or two minute reading. This is Dr. Sarma as a child. And the book starts um, in 1969 with an elephant named Lakshmi. Eight-year-old Kushal Kanwar Sarma stood by the river that flowed through his small village in Northeast India and watched Lakshmi get a bath. Kushal, or KK, as his friends and family called him, knew he should be at home studying. He knew his mother would scold him, but he didn't budge. How could he sit with his nose in a book when a few yards from the family compound, a full-grown elephant was being bathed? Rai, the elephant handler, or Mahout, as they're called in India, used a brick to scrub Lakshmi's thick hide, removing dead skin and getting rid of parasites and insects. He then gave her a pedicure, scouring her toenails, five in front, four in the back, and scraping away calluses. Lakshmi drank in water with her trunk, playfully spraying, trumpeting, and enjoying her bath time. When she emerged from the water, her dark skin gleamed, the freckled pink spots of her ears shone softly in the light. Rai splashed out of the river after Lakshmi and turned to KK. Shouldn't you be at home, he asked. KK shrugged an inch closer to the elephant. He was so happy to see Lakshmi that he forgot to answer. Instead, he reached out and ran his hand over her bristly and wrinkled skin, not minding that a few stiff hairs poked him and that his hand got wet. Lakshmi flapped her ears and squeaked as glad to see KK as he was to see her. Can I sit on her while she grazes? KK asked Rai. It was the question he asked most days. Sometimes Rai said yes, sometimes no. Today the Mahout agreed and told the elephant to kneel. KK wasted no time. Without waiting for Rai to change his mind, he held gently, he gently held Lakshmi's ear and climbed under her left foreleg. Then, with a small jump, he positioned himself behind her ears, straddling her strong neck. Once in place, KK tucked his feet into the rope of Lakshmi's neck. From so high up, he felt that he could reach out and touch the hills of Bhutan that painted the northern horizon blue. The hills were 15 miles from his village of Barama in the state of Assam. KK had never before ventured that far from home, but he often wondered what amazing things were hidden there. Little did he know that among the amazing things were the wild elephants that would come to define his life. Each January, more than 1,000 elephants, led by the matriarch, the oldest female of the herd, migrated up into the hills to escape the rainy season returning to the flatlands of Assam in May to birth their calves. So the book starts with KK's younger life and this elephant that um, again, his family is, is basically boarding. Um, it's an, a logging elephant at the time elephants were used for logging, which is now the Indian Supreme Court has banned. Um, and the chapter goes on and at the end, unfortunately, um, the elephant does die and that sort of sent young Kushal, young KK's mind into you know, how could this have happened and how can I someday grow up to do something to help elephants? So I thought I'd give some, um, just some elephant basics um, before I get back into a little bit of the reading. And my husband did take these pictures. So, so most of these pictures are, are ours that we took. Um, so one question I get a lot is Asian and African elephants, are they the same? And they're not, they're not in the same species and they're not even in the same genus. African elephants are the genus, if you remember kingdom phylum class order family genus species, Loxodonta, and elephants are in the genus Elephus. So they have a, a common ancestor, but they diverged in their different genus and species um, with, with a lot of physical characteristics that look different. Um, one characteristic, that I think is interesting. Well, besides their ears, you'll see in these, um, they don't have those big ears that the African elephants have. 
Another thing is um, at the tip of an elephant trunk, they have what's called a finger like projection and that allows them to hold tiny little delicate things. You know, an elephant can, as well as it can pick up a, a huge log, it can pick up a penny. Um, so the tip of the trunk of the elef Asian elephant has one little finger like projection and the African has two, which I thought was very interesting. Oops. Yeah, that clicked, okay. Um, as you can imagine, they are mega herbivores, very large plant eaters, and they need about 200 kilograms of food a day and about 100 to 200 liters of water. They're generalist feeders and they can feed on about 112 um, in Assam different species of plants. They also have a very large home range and need a lot of space. So all of this becomes very important, right? When we're thinking about conservation, this animal that needs all this food, all this water and all this space in a country like India, a state like Assam with a very large and growing population. Um, younger kids do like to ask how big they are. So they weigh three to seven tons, six to 14,000 pounds and they stand seven to 12 feet tall. And one of the things that was so like just off the charts stunning to me was, um, you know, you can't do this in an American zoo, but it's very different in India, elephant care and elephant practices, of course. So as I'll show you later, I got to go to these elephant healthcare clinics with Dr. Sarma um, and the females are very gentle. I could, you know, reach up and, and touch their faces and um, they're just very sensitive, very emotional, just, um, I guess the word I would use is, is they're profound, these animals, um, in their family structure and their gentleness and their intelligence. So they have, vision isn't their strongest sense. Um, you can see these long eyelashes to help protect their eyes. They have incredible hearing. They can detect sounds as low as eight hertz, as high as 1200 hertz. Um, with a frequency, um, they can, they can, their voice can span 12 octaves. And what I've read is that the greatest human singer can span about four octaves. So incredible range of vocal frequencies. You probably all know this, this idea of the infrasonic sound, the infrasonic rumble that we can't hear. It's below the range of human hearing, but you can feel it. Um, I actually did feel it when I was around the elephants um, and that they can hear the sounds for miles away, um, that infrasonic rumble for this long distance communication. And they also have many kinds of rumbles, many, many kinds of vocalizations. They have an amazing sense of smell. Um, and they can detect, for example, water sources up to 12 miles away. And they're very tactile in nature. Elephants are always touching each other. They're always checking in with each other. And their, their trunks are one of the ways that they're always exploring other elephants. And they, they use all parts of their bodies to interact with each other, um, parent to, to offspring behavior, exploring you know, the members of their, their herd, um, you know, sexual behaviors, all very tactile. And their trunk is their most tactile appendage, as I said, used to stroke, touch, explore, caress, reassure. They use their trunk to breathe, to take in water, to touch, to dust, to make sound, to, to wash, to pinch, to grab. Um, it's, it's very sensitive and it's also very strong. And as I said, they can lift very large objects in excess of 550 pounds. And there are 60,000 muscles in the trunk and no bones. And this is just interesting to me, the trunk is an elongation of the nose and the upper lip. And I love this and I, in my mind, I, I'm not gonna try to say it. I just hear Dr. Sarma talking about this, that baby elephants need to learn to use their trunks. So maybe you've seen YouTube videos. I mean, I've watched like every baby elephant YouTube video probably possible when I was writing this book. Um, and, you know, they'll swing these trunks around kind of like as Dr. Sarma said, like, what's this thing for? And they'll trip over it and, and they do need to learn how to, how to, how to navigate this trunk. Um, as I said, in Asian elephants, they don't all have trunks. There's maknas and tuskers. And then the females, those are the males, don't have trunks at all. They have little protrusions called um, tushes. Um, so they're barely visible, these tushes. And tusks, tusks serve to dig for water and salt and rock to debark trees as lovers for maneuvering. 
let's see. Um, there's so much just of the basics to say, and I realize I'm on my last elephant basic slide. So um, a couple other things that I find really just interesting. They have six sets of teeth during their lifetime. Their final set of teeth appears at about age 30. And when the last set of teeth wears down, if they're lucky enough to live to old age, um, when the teeth wear down is often the cause of their death, they, when they can no longer eat. And as we've probably all heard, elephants um, have a large, or I don't know if we've heard this specifically, but we, we, it's sort of one of these things, you know, elephants are, have amazing memories and they're very emotional. They have a very large neocortex, um, a part of their brain um, that plays a role in memory and in learning, in spatial reasoning, in perception and language. And they do have the largest brain, which makes sense of all terrestrial mammals. Um, and they have extensive spatial, temporal and social memory and sort of incredible, many, many, many other incredible things, including their, their social systems, um, which they're led by the matriarch, the oldest female of the, of the, of the herd. Um, and they do live in vast family structures with hundreds of individuals. So one thing about India um, that's interesting, again, is that there are many captive elephants and we don't call them domestic, they're not pets. They haven't been, and I write about this in the book, domesticated like dogs have been. Um, some of them come from, they'll have a female that's in captivity and a wild bull will come and impregnate her. So that's some of the way they get more, you know, you can't capture wild elephants anymore. They, they used to capture wild elephants. Um, that's illegal. Um, let's see. So there's about 1300 captive elephants in Assam and they have an important place in Indian culture. They have a long history of being captive. They're also important in terms of conservation for the genetic diversity. And you know, we could get a lot into captivity and captive elephants and how people feel. And, and one thing that I really find is, you know, when I go to another country and I'm writing about their relationship with animals and their history, it's hard to bring sort of an American conservationist value and impose that on somebody else. So for example, um, I'm only gonna speak about Assam. Some people might know about elephants in other parts of India that are treated um, in my research, perhaps not as well, like temple elephants. In Assam, the elephants, there's still not wood, still some forest left. So the elephants can have a slightly more natural life where they're left out to forage. They're not put in enclosures. Um, and it's interesting because if there is a group, the female will have her feet hobbled. Now hobbling is, is it's not something nice to see. Um, it means that they're chained and so they can't take off. They can still walk and get around. But the thing about it that I learned is none of the elephants have, to, other ones have to be hobbled because nobody, none of them will leave without her. So again, this is something that, you know, there's a lot to think about, a lot to talk about, uh, more than this presentation I can cover, but I, I do talk about it in my book. Um, so mahouts, again, I mentioned um, in that first little reading, are those um, that take care of the elephants. And again, there's so much to say. Mahouts um, traditionally were a very noble position. Um, today, because there's not as much demand for a mahout, um, it's, it's a lot of the traditional knowledge has been lost. And um, some of the mahouts, um, it, it's not as an esteemed of a position. But these elephants, and I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna do a small reading about this in a, in shortly. Um, we took this picture when they all came with their kunkis, which are the working elephants, to an elephant healthcare camp, uh, these free elephant healthcare clinics that Dr. Sarma runs to help take care of these animals. Um, now, one reason Dr. Sarma has explained that elephants are doing better um, in India is because of their Hindu religion. In the Hindu religion, which of course many, many people in India are Hindus, um, one of their gods, one of their deities is Lord Ganesha, the elephant headed God. So many people worship Lord Ganesha and therefore they worship elephants. 
So it's a very complicated situation. Um, I'll talk about human elephant conflict in a minute and, and fear people have of elephants, but at the same time, they're, they're revered. Um, so again, one of the reasons perhaps their numbers are better than in other countries. So when I went there, as I said, I got to travel to these free elephant care clinics. Now, Dr. Sarma, his training, he's a, a surgeon and he um, does anesthetics and he's a veterinarian, um, but he also runs around the, the country um, and largely Northeast India, doing all sorts of things to take care of elephants, including um, all the shots, all the vaccinations, um, the deworming of all of these captive elephants. And again, he does this for free. So just a little bit of, I'll show some slides, just a very short reading of um, a story that he told me that, that really felt very alive to me because again, I got to go and, and see these clinics. So this is him describing one of his clinics. Oh, and by the way, in the women and woman in these pictures, is his daughter, Nina, who's a lovely young woman who has now um, gotten her PhD in veterinary surgery and is following in her father's footsteps, which is really quite remarkable. One by one, six mahouts brought the elephants to Dr. Sarva, three maknas, one tusker and two females. The elephants waited their turn for treatment under a leafy canopy, touching each other with their trunks, trumpeting and chirping to their friends, for the elephants, it was social time. For Dr. Sarma, it was work. I'm ready for my first patient, he told the young Mahout when he finished setting up his medicines and equipment. The Mahout led Manimala, an old cow with speckled ears and a slow gait to him. Dr. Sarma had given Manimala a shot at her checkup three months earlier. On this day, all she and the other elephants needed were vaccinations against worms and parasites but he knew she'd remember being poked with his needle. As he mixed Manamala's vaccines with boiled sugar cane and rice, he wondered how she'd react. When he finished mixing the medicine, he put it in a metal bowl and placed the bowl on the ground. Manamala stood in front of the table, towering over him, her front legs hobbled, her mahout at her side, but she didn't eat. She just looked at Dr. Sarma and grumbled as if to say, I know you put medicine in there, I can smell it, you can't trick me. Dr. Sarma understood that Manamala, like all elephants, wasn't just clever. She was a master chemist, analyzing the world through scent. It's for your own good, he scolded, as if she were a child who could be reasoned with. Manamala flapped her ears, she blinked away a fly. Eat or you'll get sick, Dr. Sarma continued, still trying to convince the elephant of his human logic. Finally, Manamala reached into the bowl, using the appendage at the tip of her trunk, known as a finger, she brought a small bite of food to her mouth. Dr. Sarma stiffened in his seat and waited to see what would happen. Manamala was the matriarch at this camp. The other elephants were watching. They'd follow her direction. If she didn't eat, neither would they. Manamala grumbled again, but she took another bite of food. Dr. Sarma exhaled and sank back into the chair. The other elephants would now also eat their food and get their vaccinations. Elephant by elephant, Dr. Sharma, Sarma checked them all. He touched and poked, prodded and assessed each one's health. As he worked, he wondered if the elephants knew that for him, this was more than just a job. The little boy who'd first fallen in love with Lakshmi lived inside of him, but did the elephants know that? Could they feel the love in his hands? He wasn't sure, but none of them swatted or slapped or tried to sneak away. For this, Dr. Sarma was grateful. So that's some of his elephant care work. And um, this slide was wonderful because at the time, and I believe this is still true today, there were only two sets of Asian elephant twins in the world. And we got to see one of those pairs of twins. Um, and it was interesting because as I mentioned, sometimes the captive elephants, the wild bulls come and impregnate them. So this one elephant, she was 60 years old. She had these twins, she was still nursing and a wild bull had come and impregnated her and she had a baby. So she had three babies. Well, these were like teenagers she was nursing and the baby wasn't getting enough milk because the twins were taking it all. So when we were there, Dr. Sarma was really upset um, trying to figure out 
you know, as you can imagine, there's not a lot of money for elephant care, how to get these twins off the mom's milk onto some formula and get enough milk for the baby. And we got to see this. So the sad part of the presentation, um, of course, is the conservation concerns. And um, as I teach environmental science and my passion is conservation, um, you know, wild things are endangered across the planet and elephants are no different. So some of the threats to wild elephants are habitat loss and fragmentation, and subheadings of, I would say that big topic are electrocution, trenches, poisoning. And I mentioned human elephant conflict. And so this one district, which would be like a city, a small city, I mean, it wasn't a city, but you know, a district instead of using that word, where we were was called the Udalgari district. And in 2014, there were 248 cases of human elephant conflict where 57 homes were damaged, 12 people were killed, and 26 elephants were killed in this one district. Whoops. Um, so part of what Dr. Sarma does, and I'll, I'll talk about this because I think this is some of his most incredible work, is he goes and he finds these elephants that are rogue, which means they're a solitary, unpredictable elephant, um, usually in must, which is a condition where the male elephant's testosterone spikes to about 60 times as normal, which is in, in, in the wild, that makes sense, right? It's like the rut or it's like any competition of a male animal for the females. But when they're living in close confines with humans, often that must, they have nowhere to displace their aggression and it gets displaced on humans. So doc, I'm getting ahead of myself, but Dr. Sarma invented a, a protocol to go and chemically sedate these elephants to go and find them so they could be recaptured or relocated or various things instead of being killed. So to younger students, um, you know, I say, imagine you're walking to school and an elephant is walking down the street. And that's what it's like in Assam, only your house is made of bamboo or corrugated tin. And so this can be the result of what happens. And if you're in there and you're sleeping, you know, the outcomes are not always good. Um, this was a place we were standing and this grassy field was actually the grassy field of where a school was and there were elephants all around us. So they call this the conflict zone. And, and as I said, when I went, um, the project was called Elephants on the Line, which really was trying to bring people together to figure out um, as many solutions as possible from you know, different things of bees or chili peppers, um, um, education. I mean, we, we actually saw at a barbed wire fence, like this little puny barbed wire fence, a herd of about 200 elephants in a tea plantation, which I'll get to in a few minutes. Um, I'm just keeping my eye on the time so I can get to all of this. And on the other side of the fence, there were dozens, I don't know how many people gathered and they were taunting the elephants and laughing and playing music. And one elephant like went up to the fence and he trumpeted and it was really stressful. Um, so, you know, the education of how to live with elephants, right? How to not provoke them. Um, there's a lot to be, a lot of work that needs to be done. And again, you know, you can see what might happen. And one thing um, in this education component was sometimes people will brew sort of a country alcohol um, in their home and it smells really strong. As I mentioned, elephants have a great sense of smell and they're attracted to that sense of smell. Um, I've had people send me these videos, you know, people who know I love elephants of like drunk elephants and it's hilarious, haha, -ha, but it's really not funny, right? Um, you know, an elephant should not be getting into this stuff and, um, you know, the education of really don't make this stuff in your house because it will attract elephants. Um, I guess I already showed you that, who are hungry and who are thirsty. This elephant is not dead. I'm just saying that quickly. Um, this elephant was electrocuted, and I'm gonna read you a quick passage um, of, uh, all of these passages, of course, are part of longer stories um, in the book, but this, I have to sort of go with this slide, what does tea have to do with elephants? Um, because these things are related. So um, Dr. Sarma ended up saving this elephant. It's a fabulous story. This was a wild elephant. So I'm just gonna read you like a half a page and then move on to the um, story about tea. 
So on a Monday in May, 2012, a forest department warden called Dr. Sarma to say that a young wild tusker had been injured at the Paneri Tea Estate several hours from Guwahati. Dr. Sarma closed his eyes and thought about all the times he'd been called to help an elephant that had been injured in a tea plantation. Calves fell into ditches and couldn't get out. Adults ate pesticides or herbicides that had been stored on the crops, sprayed on the crops, or that hadn't been adequately stored. He touched a sagging power line, the warden exclaimed. He's been electrocuted. Dr. Sarma sighed. An elephant's sen sensitive and soft padded feet conduct electric current and more often than not, coming into contact with an electric fence means death for an elephant. Sometimes farmers intentionally let lethal power lines sag to deter crop raiding elephants. Other times the drooping lines weren't intentional and can, people complained to the electric companies asking to have the dangerous power lines fixed, but the companies didn't respond. Either way, the results were the same. Is he still alive? Dr. Sarma asked, fearing he was being called to conduct a post-mortem examination of the bull. He's still alive, but he's lying on the ground and he can't get up, the warden said. The local vet is certain he'll die. That's why I called you. Do you think you can help? And I go on and I, I discuss that story um, in great detail because you know, as you can see here, which, which goes with this Lord Ganesha thing, people are very curious about elephants. They're very worried about elephants. So, you know, he comes in, he's having to improvise. He gets these tires, you can see, to prop up the elephant. He's slopping around the mud. There's people all around. And as he des describes, this elephant could not, in any, not, quote, meaning to hurt Dr. Sarma, but lash its trunk, kick its foot, and that can kill a person. So Dr. Sarma was able to save this elephant. And one of the things that is a great story, he, he gives it all the medication it needs um, to, re to, to um, reverse the effects of the electrocution. Then he has to get the elephant to his feet and he ends up using a forklift to lift the elephant. Um, so it's a fabulous story with a, with a happy ending. I, I'm a big fan of happy endings when we can find them. Um, so, so as I said, this is related to the tea plantation. So Assam is the largest black tea growing region in the world, rivaling with China, but um, you know, 50, 51, 49% of our black tea is grown there. If you go to you know, Starbucks or Trader Joe's and you, you look at the black tea, you'll often see it's from Assam. And um, the, the temperatures, the, the environment is perfect for that. The problem is these plantations are built in the migratory corridors of these elephants. And as I said in the first chapter, these elephants migrate up to Bhutan and the matriarchs with their very long-term memories, this is where they go. This is where they've been going for eons. Well, unfortunately, although these tea plantations look beautiful and there's all this tea tourism you can do in India, you know, to go look at the beautiful tea plantations, which I'm not gonna make a total generalization because there's some tea plantations that are fair trade and they're really working to support conservation. And I'm gonna talk about that. A lot of them, the working conditions are horrible and for conservation, they're a nightmare. They look beautiful, um, but there's nothing for the elephants to eat. It's filled with pesticides and herbicides. And as Dr. Sarma says, unfortunately they're death traps for elephants. So at night they, they go there in the day because there's space. At night they wander out and part of this human elephant conflict is they'll go and look for rice or bananas. And some of the young men, and it was primarily men that we were working with, um, were sustainable farmers, subsistence farmers. I mean, um, you know, they grew rice and that was a year for their family and the elephants will come and eat the rice. And it's, it's, a, it's a horrible situation. You know, they, they don't, they love the elephants but they obviously need to feed their family. Some of the threats within these tea plantations are these trenches. Um, baby elephants will fall into the trenches and they can't get out. And, you know, that's one thing Dr. Sarma's called in to do is to bring out, to, to rescue the babies. So it's a very fraught situation. Um, and I, I wanna sort of pause right here because I don't like to keep talking about really depressing things without saying there are people working um, the best they can in this situation and, and Lisa, who I went with has started um, an elephant safe tea company where she's working with farmers who are working 
to have their land be safe for elephants, no pesticides, no herbicides, having connectivity with other farmers so that elephants can travel. And the last slide I'm gonna go, I have five more minutes, so I'm gonna go a little more quickly. I have is my website and it links to her elephant origins, elephant safe tea, in case anybody is interested, um, if anyone loves tea, it is a great way of um, giving back. So the last thing I wanna talk about is this thing I talked about called must, when the elephant, the male elephant's hormones can go to 60 times higher testosterone. Um, I talk about this both sort of in a story and I have interspersing chapters that are just more the, the biology. So you can see this elephant, we know he's in musk because of the stain on his cheek called temperin, um, which flows out of these glands between his eyes and his ears. And it's a sign that, you know, a, a mahout can recognize, but some of, again, that traditional knowledge has been lost. So sometimes a captive elephant, if it goes into musk, um, it breaks out of its hobbles, it's very strong, and, and it can get loose. I showed that picture already. So one of the things Dr. Sarma has done, as I said, is he has the protocol for sedating a musk bull elephant. He has done this 140 times to date. And this isn't just walking outside of his house. This is driving into some wild country, tracking these elephants, finding them, risking his life every time. And most of the time he has saved them. Um, there's one story I write about that does not have a happy ending where he was not able to save the elephant. And unfortunately his brother-in-law was killed in the effort. So it is quite dangerous. Um, so I think I'm just going to end with a tiny bit of reading and then I'll come back to the, the image of my book and, and if you're interested in it and my website um, for some organizations that are doing great work with conservation. Um, and I'll, I'll scan through a few slides as I finish up with this last reading. Um, this is an elephant called Manik, and it was the first elephant Dr. Sarma ever sedated. On Republic Day, January 26, 1994, the anniversary of the day in 1950 that India officially adopted its constitution and became a republic, people throughout the country were celebrating but not Dr. Sarma. Instead of joining in the festivities, he was finishing an operation on a Labrador retriever in his busy clinic in Guwahati. He just stitched the wound when a blue truck pulled up in front of his office and a young man came to the door. <clears throat> My name is Rajesh Goel, the man said, with a traditional namaskar, gesture of greeting, palms together in front of his chest. I've driven 200 miles to see you. How can I help you, Dr. Sarma asked taking in the young man's big dark eyes, long nose and tall frame. KK thought he must have been a Marwari, a group of desert dwellers from the adjacent regions of Pakistan who had widely migrated across India. I've come because of my family's tusker, Rajesh said, referring to a male elephant with tusks as opposed to a makna, a male elephant that doesn't develop any. His name is Manik and my grandfather brought him when the elephant was seven years old. That was 20 years ago. I used to ride him to the river to give him a bath when I was a child, he explained, reminding Dr. Sarma of his own childhood. For many years, Manik was a faithful companion. And when he became an adult, my uncle started using him as a logging elephant in the foothills of Aranachal Pradesh at a new sawmill in the forests around Tipi. Everything was fine until last week, Rajesh went on. Then some heavy rains forced the logging work to stop. The mahouts let the elephants loose for grazing. After five days, Manik's mahout, Ali, went out to fetch Manik from a nearby bamboo thicket. That's when he noticed that something was seriously wrong. Dr. Sarma wondered if the elephant had been hurt or if he'd hurt someone. He asked Rajas to continue, and the young man explained that Manik had lowered his head with his ears forward and erect, then he charged Ali who fled. So I go on to talk about um, that Ali, um, that Rajesh explains that the elephant is in must, he's escaped and he's been declared a rogue. A rogue is a solitary and violent elephant and the government is going to kill him. And he's come to ask for Dr. Sarma's help. Dr. Sarma says, you know, what can I do? I'm a vet because at this point he's never done this before. 
And Raja says, you know, um, I've seen a National Geographic video and it learned it might be possible to chemically restrain a wild animal using a dart loaded with a sleep inducing drug. So because of time, I'm not gonna finish the chapter, but I'll go on to say Dr. Sarma decides to take the challenge. He goes and he finds this very old, like this, um, a gun, which is for not bullets, for this, this chemical. And he goes out and he drives and he finds Manic and Manic um, charges this tree because you have to climb a tree to dart the elephant. And he's, he's you know, running at the tree. And Dr. Sarma thinks the guy who's in the tree is going to be killed. And right as the elephant's coming to the tree, they dart the elephant. And it's a very exciting um, first adventure for Dr. Sarma. He does sedate the elephant. They capture the elephant. Um, and through, here's the dart. This isn't Monic, but this is another image of an elephant he's darted. Um, and then what can happen if it's a captive elephant, um, they can hobble it again. There's medicines to bring down the testosterone and through a diet to bring down the testosterone. Um, so again, these are just some of the images of the 140 times he has done this um, to save these elephants. And of course, to save people as well, because as I've shown you, these elephants can rampage and they can kill, kill people. So I want to close um, the last slides just to show you um, these beautiful creatures one more time, these emotional, these sensitive, these incredible memories. And this is one of my favorite stories in the book that I end with. Um, I don't want to give it away because there's a beautiful narrative arc where Dr. Sarma treats this elephant, Lokamai, um, for an abscess and he works with her for weeks and he doesn't see her again for 14 years. And it's kind of giving away the arc, but 14 years later, um, well, there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful arc, I'll just say, that, that illustrates the memory and the emotions of elephants. And so this again is the book, The Elephant Doctor of India, and there's my website. All my books are available there. And again, if you just want to um, go and look at the elephant origins, how to get elephant safe tea, um, or a group that I support, Asian Elephant Support, a very grassroots group that supports a lot of conservation. All of those links are um, on my website. So, so I think that's it. And I think um, what I'll do is I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, and if there are questions, we can figure out um, if we're going to just all unmute or Val, if you're going to read them. Um, yeah, I think. Um there are a lot of us here. So if you have questions, please uh, put them in the chat. Um, and you have a couple questions. I'll go ahead and read. How do elephants in the group figure out or decide who the next matriarch is in a line after one passes away? That's a really good question, how they figure that out. Um, you know, I don't know if I can really speak to too much to that. Um, I know that there is. Um, Often it's the sort of the next oldest and the related to the matriarch. Um, so I think there's a bit of a hierarchy um, to see the next one who's in line. But one thing that I do know that I wrote, and I don't want to get real political, but I wrote this during the last uh, presidency. <laughs> and I was, I get these words just kept coming up for me that a matriarch isn't a bully. She doesn't lead by dominating other elephants. She leads by wisdom, by compassion by bringing the elephants together, by communication. And I always thought that was such a, uh, a way that, you know, we could learn from elephants. So, you know, there's probably some consensus that they reach that perhaps is above our understanding of human understanding. But I do think there's also sort of a, a lineage element of that. Okay. And another question you've pretty much answered, but if you would like to talk more about this, how could we support elephants? What would you suggest if we want to volunteer or donate? That's great. Um, I think volunteering is tricky because I think um, one of the things that there are places, elephant sanctuaries throughout um, Asia that I've heard about where they're more touristy. I think that you need to do your research to make sure like riding an elephant is not really a cool thing to do. Um, for the most part, walking with elephants is lovely. There's a sanctuary in um, Thailand, I know, where people can go out and they can walk and they can bathe. Um, so I think one thing is do your research. But I really think, you know, and I make this point a lot with my classes and with the book is 
we don't live with elephants. If we want to directly help elephants, find the best conservation group. And I do believe the two on my website, I have vetted and I think they're wonderful where most of the money is going directly. There's not overhead. There's not someone, you know, making a bunch of money. I also just want to put a shout out to, you know, it's not helping elephants, but we live with wild animals and where can we start locally? You know, I'm a big fan of thinking globally, acting locally. So, you know, finding your local, the wildlife center, um, the Audubon, like whatever group you love, all wild creatures are in danger right now, pretty much. So I believe that doing your part locally speaks globally. That's my philosophy, which you may not share, but it's sort of my passion because I know that I can't every day be flying off to India to help elephants. What can I do, right? In my backyard, in my community. Um, well, I was wondering if, please um, post questions if you have them. One of my questions was, um, how much did you know about elephants before you agreed to write the book? Nothing. Wow. Nothing, but, <laughs> nothing but that, you know, what everybody kind of knows that they're family groups and that they have good memories and, um, but really nothing. Um, it was a real journey and um, a lot about conservation principles and conservation biology, but this specific animal really, I remember Lisa um, saying the words must and mahout. I had never heard of either of those words. And now I use them as in sort of common language, like everybody knows what must is, duh. <laughs> I, I had never heard it before. Um, our I'll Asian... write about anything. I'll write about anything. That's so with cool. I, I, you know, my, I just, it's what I care about most. And people sometimes ask, you know, well, do you care about animals more than people? And to me, that's a false dichotomy. You know, conservation involves people. It's not an either or. I love animals and I love the people that were there. They're beautiful, beautiful people trying to survive and one doesn't preclude the other. Another question is, are Asian elephants ever broken for domestic use anymore? Um, you know, unfortunately in parts of India, there's some abhorrent treatment of elephants and um, thank God that was not my story because I don't have a heart that can handle that. Um, so I would say, unfortunately, that is probably the case. And, you know, Dr. Sarma really got into the face of one person even, um, you know, fired up about how he was treating his elephants. Um, so in Assam, there was a movement towards none of, you know, the bull hooks and all of these things that, that are abhorrent. Um, I think that there, there's a movement towards not using that, but in, other parts of India, I would say that there is still probably treatment we would find quite um, distasteful. I'm sorry to report that. So has Dr. Sarma read your book and has he told, talked to you about it at all? Um, God, my dream is to go visit him again. I got to do a Zoom. I got the time wrong, despite like having looked at what time it is in Assam like 5,000 times. Then we changed our clock and I didn't recheck. So um, two weeks ago, I did a presentation with the zoo and Dr. Sarma. Um, and it was lovely. It just, I say the time wrong because he came when I told him to come, which was as the presentation was ending. So um, it was lovely. Everybody stayed on. It was wonderful to see him. Um, he has... We sent him 10 copies. Um, I think he's, I think he's thrilled. I think he's too busy, you know, like <laughs> honestly, he is such a busy guy. Um, I don't know how much he's had a chance to really let it sink in, but I think he's, I think his daughter's more delighted than, than, than <laughs> but that might be partly because, you know, she's in her twenties. So she has social media. And so I can see her sharing it. Well, I um, will let everybody unmute themselves. Um, you all have permission to do that now. We just have a couple minutes left. If there's anyone who would like to unmute and say anything to Janie or ask a question, Sheila, you're first, if you would like to say something. Oh, oh I was just in following directions and unmuting. Oh. Janie, that was such a fabulous talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, Thanks for coming. Oh, I, I, it was wonderful. Really wonderful. And of course, if you want to learn more, all these stories I have written about, and I, I, I guess I should say, I didn't really, I guess I'm touch, touch on this. There's 
story chapters that are the stories interspersed with chapters um, that are more the sort of the natural history, cultural history. So, um, you know, there's sort of both ways of learning through, through the story and through the more direct, you know, this is what's the biology or the ecology. Well, and congratulations. Uh, before everybody came on, Janie was telling me her book has a star review in Kirkus, which is a big deal. And I was telling her libraries around the country will be buying it because of that. <laughs> and um, it was also reviewed in Library Journal, which is also a really big deal. So um, congratulations on all your success and um, where you are now and where this book is going to take you. It's really exciting. Thank you. I really and she was it. highlighted in Time for Kids. The book was oh. highlighted. Great. Time magazine for kids. Wow. Yeah. That's a big thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I All appreciate right. that. Well, if there are no more questions, we'll end now. Um, again, you can unmute yourself. And if you want to take a couple of minutes to greet Janie, please stay on and do so. Thank you for coming, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. Yay. <laughs> Thanks. Wonderful. I love that person.